Uh, I don't think it's the monoclonal antibodies that are making him feel better. It, they may have worked in terms of neutralizing the virus, but we don't know. He's an N of one here, Jake. Sanjay, you, you regularly cover when candidates run for office and reveal their, their health records. I remember you doing it with John McCain when he ran in 2008. I remember you doing it uh, yeah. with, with plenty of other. I could go through a list. Have you ever seen a, a White House cover up and hide so much information about such a serious disease? No, I, I, I really haven't. I mean, sometimes, you know, the, the uh, summaries that you would get from some of the candidates would be very, very cursory, you know, but they would have the, the basic details, the meds, the, the test results, you know. Going back for some time, you'll remember even, you know, back two years ago, uh, they did a press briefing, Ronnie Jackson did, where he came out and talked about the president's potassium and his sodium and he's on these various medications. At no point did he say that the, patient, uh, the president also had a coronary CT scan to evaluate him for heart disease. Never offered up that information. It only came out because I asked him about it, and then he said it. So he tells us basic lab values correct, but doesn't tell us about an abnormal test result in a very significant exam. And that's been a pattern that we've seen over and over again. 2008, John McCain let us have access to all of his medical records for a period of time. So it's varied in terms of access, but this is a, a totally different level and, and significant sins of omission, perhaps outright, uh, outright telling us false information at times. Yeah, and the reports, of course, about the doctors and others being forced to sign non-disclosure agreements after President Trump went on that secret trip to Walter Reed last year. There's obviously a lot we don't know. Uh, let me ask you, because President Trump uh, just announced that he's expected to host an event at the White House tomorrow. He's expected to address the attendees from the balcony. Uh, this is just two weeks after the Supreme Court ceremony in the Rose Garden that Dr. Fauci today called a super spreader event. Um, we don't even know if he's still contagious or if he's tested negative. Yeah, I mean, and he still could be sick. I mean, don't forget, a week ago today, he was essentially medevaced from the White House to Walter Reed, dropped his oxygenation, needed supplemental oxygen, was on all these drugs that we just talked about. So this is, a, you know, he's likely still sick. I mean, it's just, we say that because you look at the time course of the disease. And again, the timeline still doesn't make total sense here. It, it changed even a little bit today as I was doing some reporting on this. But nevertheless, he is likely still sick. But Jake, even before the president's diagnosis, the idea in the middle of a pandemic of having an event, aggregating people together, even if it's outside, we saw, as you mentioned, what happened before. I mean, that was a super spreader event in that many people became infected as a result of that event or the events right around it. So regardless of whether the president has COVID, that, that's not a good idea. That's a great point. That Even if he is uh, no longer contagious, we do, which we do not know, it's still a bad idea. Listen to uh, Trump coughing on Hannity last night. Oh, and I think the first debate, they... Yeah, Excuse me. On the first debate, they oscillated the mic. Well, I want him to vote, but I will say this. Absentee is okay, because absentee ballots... Excuse me. Absentee ballots are fine. I mean, he sounds sick to me. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, I, I, th I think he's still sick. I mean, you know, it, it, this could be a, a sort of, you know, a, a milder cough. But again, in the context of he was medevaced a week ago. He's been on oxygen recently, all these drugs. He's probably still on the steroids again if he's following the basic trial protocol. Um, he's 74 years old. I mean, he, he's... I mean, just uh, from, from a humanity standpoint, I mean, the guy should just take a break for a while. I, I hope that his doctors are telling him that. I don't, I mean, just not listening. I've had patients that have been difficult to counsel in the past as well, and sometimes you just got to sit down and really have a tough conversation. I don't know if that's happening or not, but I agree, Jake. He sounds sick, and he's had this significant medical history over the last week. And he has pre existing conditions, and he's clinically right. obese. Sanjay, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for a new yeah. CNN Global Town Hall. Coronavirus facts and fears. Dr. Sanjay Gupta, Anderson Cooper uh, will be joined by other experts in their field. That's tomorrow at 8 p.m. Is the plot to kidnap the Michigan governor just the tip of an extremist iceberg? That story coming up. In our national lead, the governor of Michigan, Democrat Gretchen Whitmer, 
is now explicitly calling them domestic terrorists. We're talking about a group of suspects accused of planning to kidnap her and overthrow the government. Michigan's attorney general says groups such as the Wolverine Watchmen are making similar plans across the United States. Thirteen men now charged with alleged domestic terrorism for their planned attack. CNN Sarah Seidner joins me now. And Sarah, you spoke to the owner of the store where the suspected terrorist plot leader was living. What did you learn? Yeah, we talked to uh, a gentleman named Bryant Titus. He says that they were friends. He's known him for a very long time uh, and that he had just been kicked out of his uh, place where he was living with his girlfriend. He offered him a place to live. He had been uh, working for Titus as well. Uh, his name is Adam Fox, and the FBI says he is uh, the, the, was the leader of this plot to overthrow the government and also to try and kidnap uh, the Michigan governor. Um, and so he says, look, he was living down in this basement. And it's, it's quite an interesting shot when you see him uh, opening up this very heavy wooden, um, what looks like a door that's on the floor. And then you walk down deep into the basement. He was living there with his dogs. But he said, you know, everything was fine until he started noticing packages showing up. Um, and he was concerned about what he was seeing in those packages from Amazon. I knew he was getting more from Amazon. He was getting buying more stuff. What was he getting from Amazon? Like uh, uh, MREs, food, stuff like that. So survival stuff that it yeah. seemed like? Yeah, and I told him, you have to have your own place on 1 November. Well, he was buying more like attachments for like an AR-15. And so you heard him talking about him buying attachments for um, AR-15s, buying MREs. Uh, that, that's you know food that can be stored for a very long time, sort of like a survival mode. And he got he got a bit worried and said, you know what, you're going to have to leave. Like you, you can't stay here. Uh, he said that he was aware that um, that Fox had been part of a self-styled uh, militia group, but had been kicked out. He said. He said then Fox created his own self-styled uh, militia. Um, now. Now he is charged uh, with many different charges, but charged in what is being considered a domestic terrorist plot to try and kidnap the governor. Jake? And Sarah, the Governor Whitmer has directly tied the, the president's refusal to condemn specific far-right violent groups, not to mention his encouragement of protesters against her. She's tied that to this plot. President Trump responded by again attacking her and how she's governing. Yeah, she did. And, and, and look, let's, let's listen to what some of the things that she's been saying. She talked about when he was at the presidential debate and how uh, he was unable to very clearly condemn white supremacists. Um, she then talks about also uh, that she sees him as encouraging extremists. Anyone who uh, gives safe harbor to or encouragement to is complicit. And that's precisely what he did on the national stage in the middle of a presidential debate when he said, stand, stand by. She also uh, talked about the, the president lambasting her for how she's handled the coronavirus. Um, and he did it again. Uh, his response to her saying that was that uh, she's done a terrible job, that she locked down her state for everyone um, and then failed to thank what he said his Justice Department and his federal law enforcement officers uh, for foiling this plot. Um, and he says he is, you know, he's always stood against white supremacy. So you have a, a very strong political back and forth going back and forth between the president and the woman who was named uh, as a, a potential victim in this plot. Jake. All right, Sarah Seidner, thank you so much. The FBI director, Christopher Wray, has been warning that violent far-right extremism is the top domestic threat to the United States. The Department of Homeland Security just released its threat assessment report, which showed 2019 was the most deadly year for extremism in the United States since the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995. Joining us now to talk about all this is former federal prosecutor Laura Coates and the former director of communication for U.S. national intelligence during the Obama years, Sean Turner. Sean, how much worse do you think things are going to get with this far right violence? Well, Jake, I think there's pretty good evidence to suggest that this is going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Look, I think that we are seeing a resurgence in militia and a militia movement in this country. And there's some pretty clear indicators of that. Like as we watch these groups, we're seeing that militia groups are showing up at counter at, at uh, peaceful protests around the country in numbers unlike anything we've ever seen before. 
Uh, in every state, we're seeing these groups show up. They're heavily armed and uh, they are, are standing side by side and oftentimes with law enforcement and sometimes they're impersonating law enforcement in order to get things done. We're also seeing an increasing sophistication in the way that they're communicating. Uh, it's really startling to see that I'm seeing some of the very same types of tactics that we saw with foreign terrorist organizations and the way that or these organizations here in the United States are trying to conceal their communication. And the other the other really significant indicator is that their recruiting is unlike in the past. It's open. It's uh, it's out there. It's uh, it's blatant. And so these groups are growing significantly in every state across the country. So from my perspective, there's pretty clear indicators here that this is the kind of thing that's going to touch every state across the country and something that every governor ought to be concerned about. Well, what you you just said is what the attorney general in in Michigan uh, said. Take a listen. What we're seeing here in Michigan right now, it's not just a Michigan problem. It's an American problem. Uh, And I I think there's going to be more incidences to come. Laura, if you were advising governors, what would you tell them? Well, first of all, I mean, it's just so terrifying to think of the notion that this is probably the tip of the iceberg, as Sean and the Attorney General of Michigan has noted about this very issue. But of course, this all goes back to leadership from the top. And if people are increasingly becoming empowered and emboldened with winks and a nod or not even as subtle as that, by feeling somehow that they are validated or justified in their conduct, by perhaps the president of the United States through his commentary or any other leader, well, then the governors have to individually make sure that they are able to harness this issue to contain it by ensuring that their laws and that their the consequences for actions like this are carried out through prosecutions like what we're seeing in Michigan, that there will be no safe harbor for terrorism within the United States of America, within the boundaries of individual states, that if they are confident in their prosecutions and in their investigations, then the deterrent aspect of justice may be able to curb what has become an explosion of this sort of rhetoric. Because deterrence is one of the key ways you actually are able to stop behavior, not just by the threat of, um, of a law existing, but actually prosecuting those who even t- develop plans, let alone carry them out. Sean, um, you heard the, the governor of Michigan blaming the president in part uh, for this planned attack. We should note there is no evidence that we have seen at all that members of this group were specifically motivated by Trump. Um, He did tweet out back in April to liberate Michigan. uh, And obviously he has gone back and forth on whether or not white supremacist groups or or far right groups uh, should be specifically condemned. One day he'll do it. The next day he will refuse to do so. What do you make of all this? There's this thing called stochastic terrorism. I think that's the term for it, where the idea where you you know, you create uh, an environment through your words Uh, that uh, encourages people to take the law into their own hands and and act violently. Uh, Do you think that that is a factor here or could be? Well, it certainly could be, Jake. Look, it's it's legitimate to ask ourselves, what has changed over the past several years that have caused these groups to uh, come out of the woodwork? Uh, Look, it's always been the case that these groups existed, and at any given time, they were more active in some states than others. But over the past several years, we've seen these groups sort of activate in states all across the country. And so we have to ask ourselves, what's happening that's that's causing that? Now, I think that the answer is, is pretty clear. What's happened is that these groups have been led to believe that they no longer have to exist in the shadows. In fact, I'd go even further to say that a lot of these groups believe that they now have a mandate to rise up and to, uh, to, to uh, take their political disputes to the streets. That mandate that they believe they have is oftentimes because of the, the political rhetoric that we see in this country. It's oftentimes because of what the president says. Look, when we look at these groups at protests all across the country, these militia groups are there, and so often, what are they carrying with them? Not just their guns, not just their AR-15s, not just their military gear, but they, they're often carrying signs that support the president. Okay, so I think it's pretty clear that the president's rhetoric is having a significant impact on this. And, Laura, the big concern uh, right right now is that if President Trump loses, and who knows what's going to happen, it's in the hands of the voters, but if he does lose, uh, that he incites some of these groups, uh, and who knows what happens. 
Well, first, I want to be very clear that we don't have, as you mentioned, Jake, the direct correlation between the actions of these individuals in Michigan who are acting specifically at the express mandate or the behest of the president. And, you know, you, normally in the law, the more context a prosecutor has to provide in order to create a causal link, the less likely they're going to be able to determine that causal link for the benefit of the jury, let alone the court of public opinion. Having said that, you're absolutely right about the idea of what the president has said and his rhetoric and about the numerous calls. 